Okay. So are we ready? Let's just make sure we're ready. I think we are ready. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be watching the chat as I um, speak as well. But we're going to be talking about dealing with childhood experiences. A few things I'll say about me very quickly. Um, key things that I think would help you relate to where I'm coming from is that I am a teacher and I've been a classroom teacher for 17 years. And the reason why I share that with you is because you'll understand that I have been inside the pockets and working with children for that long in a classroom setting. It's not just one child, it's not two child, there's a group of them and you're having to deal with them. So that experience for me really opened my eyes to understanding the patterns of children. And then when I meet the parents at parents evening or you meet parents so much as a teacher, you start to understand how these patterns are forming. And because I teach a wide range from age four all the way to 18, I actually see the things, the areas where my 18 year olds are stuck where my 16, 15 year olds are stuck, I can see how things in their childhood have led to that. And that really became my experience and what pushed me to start speaking to parents. I'm like, parents, I am seeing these patterns in children. I didn't even recognize them in myself initially, but I'm seeing the patterns in children. Some of these children are taught when they were four and they've grown through the years. Think about it. If I've been teaching 17 years and I've taught, I've seen some children grow. And I'm like, wow, I can see how this pattern was playing out. I can see. So I started speaking to parents. I'm like, parents, listen, the things that we are doing, the things that you are doing in the way you relate to children, a lot of times it's unintentional. I haven't yet met a parent whose desire was to harm their child. I haven't yet met them. I don't know if they exist. We always want the best for our children. But actually, the things that we're doing unintentionally could be causing things in our children that actually are not ideal. And that's where I'm coming from when I speak to you. So I speak to parents. I work with parents, not just parents, even anyone. I speak, I work mainly with parents. I also work with individuals who have got to a point in their life that they're thinking, I just feel stuck. I don't really know why these patterns are repeat, repeating in my life. I don't really know why I think the way I think, do the way, and they just feel stuck. They don't know what's wrong, but they know something is wrong. And that's where we're able to look into childhood experiences. And I'll tell you why this is important. Let, let's talk about why it's important. Okay, right. So why? It's important because childhood experiences are most likely dictating how you live your life now without you being aware. Some people are like, why do I need to think about my childhood? That was then, this is now. Well, hey, it's one long life. There's not a point where childhood ends and adulthood begins. It's a continuation. Whatever was going on then, as long as you don't intentionally stop, interrupt, and change pattern or change your path, you will continue to be going in that path you were from childhood. If I cut a piece of my cloth now and you're examining the cloth, guess what? It will be the same as where it came from. That's it. Unless I do something different with a piece of cloth I cut, it will be the same as where it came from. And so looking at our childhood experiences is vital because that's where we are coming from and where we are going subconsciously. Our childhood experiences forms our subconscious programming, which is running in the background a lot of the times without our knowledge. This is why we have to be intentional and aware of it. Now, the reason why, what we do when we look at a childhood, and I say this a lot to parents or to people when I'm speaking to them, and they're like, oh, why don't you look at my childhood? It was in the past. And you hear some, you hear narratives like, forget your past. Don't live in the past. I agree. Don't live in the past. Learn from the past. So I'm not asking you that let's go back into your childhood and live there and sit there and be the victim there. No, I'm saying let's look back. Let's get in there. Why? So that we can uncover wisdom for growth and healing. Your childhood is affecting you whether you like to admit it or not. So we might as well take a look, not so that we can live there, so we can learn from it. You want to reflect back onto your childhood from a non-judgmental way. You're going back to your past, not to, as I said, not to judge, not to dwell, not to sit, not to cast blame. That's not what we're suggesting this. It's so that you can actually learn to understand the patterns that are affecting your present now so that you can take responsibility. And what do you take responsibility for? For your healing. It's you now. 
it's you now whatever happened then like the video said at the start whatever happened then i'm not going to say forget about it i'm saying let's go and understand it so that we can take responsibility and make the changes now because what we're not aware of we cannot change so let's talk about very briefly let's talk about um what are the major obstacles to dealing with our childhood experiences what are the things you know when you talk to people about we need to deal with your childhood experiences what obstacles do people face one of the main obstacles that people face is this they think their past has no impact on their present it's my past it's not affecting me now you know they'll even argue with you you know it's no 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 it's not affecting that was my past. my past okay fine if your past is not affecting your present let me ask you if you're a parent here it also means that you're telling me that your present with your children, what you're doing and how you raise them has no impact on their future. Is that true? If you're a parent, are you telling me that what you're doing with your child today has no impact on their future? Because if you're saying that, that's when I'll agree with you that your past has no impact on your present. We all know that what we do with our children now has an impact on their future. So why do you not agree or admit or realize that what happened in your past has an impact on your future which is your present now it is having an impact whether we like it or not whether we realize it or not and sometimes we can't even remember what it is about our childhood okay we can't even remember what it is about our childhood but actually it's still running in the program subconsciously without you realizing another ob obstacle to dealing with your childhood experience is that we feel ashamed so we don't want to go there. It's too shameful. Me, I, I get that one. It's too shameful. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. It's too painful sometimes. The heart. So I'd rather just act like it didn't happen. No, no, no. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. I understand that. But the truth about the matter is this. Whilst we feel that shame, sometimes the shame is because we're not talking about it. We're not dealing with it. When we deal with it, we're able to rise above it. But when we shove it in the background, ignore it, act like it didn't happen, that's when the shame builds. Shame thrives in dark areas where we hide. Oh, shame thrives. We can actually remove that shame by facing it in a non-judgmental way, like I already said, and say, yeah, this happened. And this is the wisdom and the healing I'm getting from it, from it. And I take responsibility for my present, which will affect my future. Oh, it does. Okay. Another reason why we don't like to look at our past is because we see, we feel like we're making excuses. Like when someone explains about their past, you know, they're also oh, just making excuses. So because we say that about other people, we say that about ourselves as well. Oh, I don't want to make excuses. I just forget it. I just want to go okay don't make excuses i am not asking us to look to the past and make excuses we're looking there so that we can understand so that we can start to make the changes that we need to make what the final one which i think is a big one is we don't want to look at our past because we feel like we're blaming our parents oh the number of times I speak to people and they can't even complete their sentence. They're like, oh yeah, this happened. But it wasn't my, it wasn't my mom's fault. It wasn't my dad's fault. I'm like, just explain what happened. I'm not, we're not, I'm not we're not blaming anybody, but people can't even, it's like, no, but my, my dad did the best that they could do with everything. They, I, I know your dad did the best you could. Can we just address how it affected you? We're not talking about your dad here. We're not talking about your mom here. We're trying to understand how it affected you so we can help you. Don't worry. Sometimes we feel the guilt. Like I'm talking about my parents behind their back. And actually, when you are trying to deal with your past, you might feel like, no, it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm ungrateful. In fact, people will tell you that you're being ungrateful. <laughs> no, actually... I need to address this thing because it's affecting me. I don't even need to address it with anybody. I need to address it with myself, with a professional, someone that understands it so they can help me through it. I'm trying to get through something. I'm not trying to lay blame. It's irrelevant. Um, it's pointless trying to lay blame. It's an energy waste. What I'm asking is that you actually understand your past so that you can make those changes. And we'll talk about how to make those changes as quickly as we can as we can so i'm asking you i think someone's mic is unmuted i'm not sure who it is All right but um i'm asking you please to not dismiss your past please make this make this be open-minded here 
And make this commitment as you listen to this talk, not to dismiss your childhood. Don't deny your childhood. Don't downplay your childhood. Don't defend your childhood or what happened. I'll just take that one more time. Don't dismiss it. Oh, please, it's not important. <laughs> okay, if it's not important, then don't do anything for your children because it's not going to be important for their future. Don't deny it. Oh, it never happened. No, it didn't happen. It could have happened to me. And do you know what? We do that because of the shame, by the way. So please, let's also be aware. Even if you want to deny something to the world, please don't deny it to yourself. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, not to ourselves. Don't downplay it, minimize it. Oh, it was just a little thing. You know, they, you know, I've heard, oh my gosh, I've heard some people say some things, but they downplay it. One of the ways I hear that downplaying happened a lot is when it comes to discipline. They made me carry a brick for three hours, or they made me stand and say, but no, it was just a little, I know it was small, it was funny. <laughs> the way they flogged that was funny. No, no, don't downplay the situation. It's not funny. Don't downplay it. The reason why this, and finally, I say, don't defend. Don't, you're not trying to defend your parents. They did not. Yes, of course, they didn't mean it. Which parent does? You and the mistakes you make as a parent, the mistakes I make as a parent. Do you think I mean to hurt my children? I don't. We are imperfect beings. We are going to make mistakes. I don't need my children to defend my mistakes. No, I don't want them to defend my mistakes. And if they ever come to me and say, mommy, you know what you did when I was a child? It, it really had this impact on me. Do you know what I will not do? I will not dismiss them. I will not deny what they're saying. I will not downplay what they're saying. And I will not defend myself. So don't do that for your parents. And your parents too, me, I won't do that to my children. That way we can start the healing journey. Okay, everybody has weaknesses. Thank you, I love that. Everybody has weaknesses. So I hope that is clear so that we can really get into this. Just remember the aim of what we're doing is not to judge anybody, is to reflect in a non-judgmental way so we can uncover wisdom for growth and healing. That's what we want to do. So let's look at how our childhood experiences might be affecting us now. Let's look. Oh, there's so many ways. But in fact, we can look at why they affect us. Why? Because in childhood, that's where we develop our subconscious beliefs. They start in childhood. When we're children, we get messages from our environment. That's what we're getting. Think about it. We come as children, we're babies. We don't come with a language. We don't come with any way to defend ourselves or to influence anything. We are completely there to receive from the environment. That's how we were sent to this earth. And I believe that, you know, God, God could have, I always say to people, God could, could have created us as complete adults, be able to fish and, and hunt and, you know, right from our childhood, from, right from when we're born. But no, he actually designed it in such a way that we are born in that position where the people who we come through can have an influence on us and the reason why is because we are human beings we interact our major need in life is for connection and interaction he is a god of relationship we need to be in relationship with each other that's why children come like that because they can start that relationship from birth if you came to this earth able to you know use the loo change your nappy feed yourself hunt you will not need anybody else and that's not his design, because actually it's through that interaction that we grow and influence our world. He sent us here to influence the world. So without relationship with others, we can't. And that's why we come through parents and through other people so that we can learn how to influence and, and allow them to influence us as well. So we come as babies like that. Everything around us starts to affect our sub subconscious. If you cry, as a baby, and these, these are studies that have been done, feel free to search them up later. If you cry as a baby and your mom or dad comes and responds to your need, you get the message that this world is a safe place. You get the message that I am loved. I am seen. I am noticed for what I do. My cry for help is acknowledged. That's the message you get. But actually, if, you're, if you are crying and you are left ignored, or when the parent comes, they are frustrated and angry, which I've been there. So this is not, yes, that was me, I'll be honest with you. But you know, they're frustrated and angry because they're tired, they're stressed. You get the message that, oh my gosh, there's something about me that is not lovable, it's not worthy enough. This is why I'm being treated this way when all I needed 
was a hug or all I needed was it was too cold. All I needed was I needed my nappy chain. Look at the way they're responding to me. So you start to get that message from very, very early on. Anything I'm saying here, please realize, can I just, in fact, let me say this. If you're a human being on this earth, you will have a negative impact on somebody else. So don't even feel bad. It will happen. It's, it is inevitable unless you're a saint. Unless, I don't know, you will, we all will, especially our children. That's not the problem. The problem is not the impact we have on them because we will have positive and negative impacts. That's not the problem, so don't feel bad. The problem is when you don't repair. A lot of times we don't repair because we're not looking inwards, okay? And again, it, we don't repair with them, but the biggest issue is when we don't repair with ourselves. This is why dealing with your childhood experience is so crucial because we need to make that repair with ourselves. Our own healing, it's crucial, okay? So subconscious programming in our childhood keeps us stuck. At the time when we got this message, I didn't say the message was sent. See me, I'm just constantly defending myself so people don't misunderstand this. I didn't say your parents sent the message. You got that message. I'll give you an example. Two, uh, I'm aware of um, this family, two children. One of them was, had all, one of them had all like so many different activities they had to go to. And so the mom was like, okay, she would take that one for these activities and all of that. And then because of that, she didn't want the younger one to be dragged from activity A to activity B. The younger one was only four. She didn't want them to be dragged, dragged, dragged around. So she was like, okay, you know what? I'll get a babysitter to look after the four-year-old whilst I take the older one out. And I'm doing that so that I can make sure the, the, the younger one is at home. He can relax. He can go to bed early, not being dragged about after school to different activities, right? That was the mom's aim. The message the four-year-old got was, my mom loves my older sibling more than me. I'm not talking about what message they sent. It's the message you received. We receive these messages because of the environment, what is going on around. It was, he was, the, the younger one was consistently left. He would cry and he couldn't understand why am I not the chosen one? Couldn't get it. When we are that young, we're not resourceful enough to understand that, oh, mommy just got a promotion. Daddy just lost his job. We don't get those nuances. As far as we're concerned, they don't love me. That's why this is happening. So you have to understand those things become beliefs that affect how we show up in the world and how we view the world. Our childhood experiences affect how we view the world and what we believe about ourselves. Okay, I hope this is making sense. So anything in the chat will just help me understand that this is making some sense. Let me know that this is making some sense before I move on to the next bit. So please understand the key thing in your childhood is that your childhood experiences will affect how you view who? Yourself and the world, okay? Very important. So let's look at this. Now, the next thing I want us to talk about is this. Where does this tend to show up? So I want us to start looking at ourselves now. Why, why do I need to deal with my childhood experiences? It's not affecting me, you know? I turned out fine. Have you heard that, that statement before? I turned out fine. Oh, it's not affecting me. Nothing in my child is affecting me. I'm fine. Okay, let's look at a few areas. Let's just look at a few areas, okay? Because whether it's positively or negatively, there's an impact. One of the ways that it shows up a lot, our childhood experiences, is in number one, our authenticity. A lot of people don't know who they are. A lot of people don't know who they are. And why is this so important? Because in childhood, when we are born, the number one thing that every human being needs is authenticity. They need to, who you are, you were sent to this world as an individual with your own individual needs, with your own individual desires, all that kind of stuff. And you were sent, I believe, with a purpose, a plan that was arranged and organized for you before you were sent to this earth. In fact, you were formed and designed to fit that purpose. You come into this earth, we have a purpose to fill, fulfill, right? But we also come to this earth, and that's our authenticity, please. And then we come into this earth and there's a need for attachment. 
Attachment means we need to be connected to the individuals around us, actually our parents. But what happens in our childhood is this, based on the way we are raised, we start, it's, it's authenticity versus attachment. Based on the way we are raised as children, we start to forget who we are in order to please our parents. And the more we do that, we want to please them. So we're going towards attachment towards them because we're, and we are forgetting who we are. We're losing our authenticity. Simple things like you have a child that rather sit in the mud and pick up worms and butterflies and loves to see the different colors and loves to say, oh, look at this worm. I love how it's crawling. And then you might have a mom or dad that goes, that's just a simple example. And the child, very young, realizes that, oh my goodness, playing with nature is not the right thing to do. Why did you bring this mud into this house? Get out, take it out. Whoa. My, my attachment, or my, or my rather, my being drawn to nature is not acceptable here. A child that loves arts and crafts and all that kind of stuff. Oh my God, you're so bad at maths. And they're being flogged for not knowing maths. I, I used to example all the time because I'm a maths teacher. They get the message, math is the thing that is important to my parents. What is important to me, the art and the craft and all of that kind of stuff is not important to my parents. When I look at what's important to me versus what's important to my parents, I will choose what's important to them, forget my authenticity because my life depends on pleasing them. As a child, you live to please your parents whether you like it or not, because they, you are dependent on them for survival. Oprah was asked about successful people. She was asked a question, I don't know if you've ever seen this um, clip with Oprah and Trevor Noah. And he was asking her, you've interviewed so many successful people. What makes, what is, you, what is the common thread with successful people? And what did she say? Successful people know where they want to go. Okay, we're all going somewhere. But successful people know where they want to go. Why? Because they know who they are. So they're making the steps to go in that direction. A lot of us, when I speak to a lot of people, we don't know who we are. We don't know. I ask people, what does so and so, and so? I didn't pick a name from the group. Uh, you know, and if I ask someone, so, okay, shall I tell me, what do you want to do? What do you want in life? And a lot of times, people are stunned. It's like some people have never really asked them, I don't know what I want. I don't really know what's important to me because you've spent so long living your life based on what's important to the other people around, the primary carer, usually the parents around you. And that's the kind of thing that is keeping you stuck. We are stuck when we don't know where we're going. We are stuck when we don't know who we are because we cannot move in that direction. So we are going like this confusion, confusion. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. What I don't know why. Like I don't, I've been living my life. In fact, I'm a doctor because they wanted me to be a doctor. I don't even know why I'm here. I am just going because their definition of success was the external things I achieve, but actually, success is being your authentic self. Think about people you love and admire and you look up to. You don't admire them because they are, they are doctors, lawyers, nurses, or whatever it is. You, you admire them because they're doing what they're born to do and you can see it. That is authenticity. A lot of times in the way we relate to our children, we move them away from their authentic self to what we think they should be doing. And that's why when they get to adults, they are stuck or unfulfilled or not happy, not satisfied. And it's almost like I'm ungrateful. I have all this stuff, but yet I feel so unsatisfied. What's wrong with me? Is how the person feels. Do you know what it means to be a strong-willed child? If you have a strong-willed child, listen up. <laughs> or if you were a strong-willed child, a strong-willed person, a strong-willed child is someone that doesn't allow you easily to break their authenticity. They fight you. That's what your child is doing. The other child might just go, okay, fine, I'll do this, whatever you say I should do. The strong-willed child is going, no, I know who I am and I will fight you before I let you take that away from me. They will fight you for longer. That's what we call strong will. And we don't like that because they're going against you. Have you stopped to think, instead of controlling my strong will, child, let me actually stop to hear what they're saying. Because this child, just like Jesus, by the way, did you not know I would be in my father's house? Did you not know? 
that's what your strong will tell to tell you. Why are you, why are you looking everywhere for me? Did you not know? So your strong will child has a greater sense of their authenticity and they will hold on to it for longer. But trust me, attachment, being close to you as a parent is very important as well. So even though they fight you and say, no, this is what I want to do, this is what I like, and they're fighting you, trust me, when you go away, they go to their rooms just like I did because I was a strong will child as a child and, they, and we fight ourselves. Why am I not lovable? Why can't they just accept me for who I am? Why don't, why don't they ever listen to me? You never listen to me. You just don't feel heard. You don't feel listened to because you're always fighting for your voice to be heard. So one major way in which our childhood shows up is in our lack of authenticity, not knowing who we are, not knowing our purpose. Another way in which our um, childhood experiences shows up in our life now is in our discipline. A lot of us can't follow through. And, you know, when people talk to me about discipline, I'm not going to make a speech about discipline. It's one of my favorite topics. We talk about discipline, how to discipline a child. And we think it's by flogging, flogging. Some of you were flog, 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 but still you can't follow through. You can't be consistent. You can stick with a habit. You feel confused. You can't make a decision. Please understand that those kinds of ways of disciplining were not disciplining. That wasn't discipline at all, but I'm not going to go into that. So please understand that actually some of us, how you know that your childhood experience is affecting you now is that you lack boundaries. You let people in, walk all over you. You don't know how, because as a child, there were no boundaries. If your parents, and I'm very careful with my children, if your parents can walk into your room and take your stuff, if they can go through your thing anyhow, then you don't believe that that's actually setting you up for not being able to tell people to stop because they have the authority to do that as far as they're concerned. So therefore, other people have the authority to do that as well. You give people that authority. If somebody can, you know, the, the things you have to, it's so important. We don't know how to set boundaries and we don't set boundaries with our children. We feel like we have any right to do anything with them. So therefore they go into the real world and also believe that people can do anything with them at all. If we at home in, in, in the discipline area, make our children feel like they can, or as a child, anybody could talk to you anyhow, Anybody could make you feel anyhow, you will go out into the world and let people talk to you that way. That's what tends to happen. So not being able to follow through with something, not being able to stick, not having a consist consistent habit. I use this example all the time because it's just an easy one. Any kind of, um, the one I always use because it's such an easy one is the weight loss one. We can't stick to a habit. Why do you think that is? We haven't learned what actual discipline is. Sometimes I say to people, they say, oh, I'm just not good at making decisions. Because who let you make a decision when you were a child? Who let you make a decision? Were you allowed to make a decision? So right now you're here and maybe your brothers were allowed to make decisions, but you as a female were not allowed to make decisions. So now when you're in a room with other, with men in the boardroom, you can't speak up. Whatever I'm going to say might not be important because that's what you were told when you were younger. Oh, please, everyone's talking to you, you're talking. So you go up, you're in the boardroom and everybody's talking, you feel like you shouldn't be talking. So these things show up in our adulthood. Another way is resilience. A lot of people I speak to, especially in the, in the sort of African setting, tend to be quite academically resilient, not all the time, but tend to be, but when it comes to emotional resilience, there's nothing there. This happens to us a lot because actually in our childhood, we weren't really taught to be emotionally resilient. Some of us in childhood were the people that our parents came to to complain about the other spouse. And we don't realize that that's having an impact on us now as adults. So some of us had to forget our emotional needs in order to meet the needs of that parent. And we don't understand why now we don't know what we need, what we want, what's important to us. We don't know because for so long we have avoided and ignored our needs to meet their needs. Some of us were made to feel like we were the problem for things that were going on. So we grow up and we still believe that we're the problem. We can't see that we're not the problem. Some of us were made to feel like you, if not for you. If you were this, if you were more this, if you were more that, and we still think that about ourselves now. I, I wonder if I'm relating to anyone. If I'm related, feel free. It might be a bit hard to admit, but these are the things that are showing up and we don't even realize it. You might think of yourself as nobody likes me, nobody listens to me, nobody cares about me. But actually, that might not be true. It's just the message you got when you were a child. People care about you now, but actually, you don't realize it. Because you got that message as a child when you were very young, it formed in your brain and it stuck. And the biggest way 
in which our childhood experiences shows up in adulthood. The biggest way, we're ready to hear the biggest way. I've talked about authenticity, which is huge. Discipline, huge. Resilience, huge. But let's talk about the biggest way that our childhood experiences shows up in adulthood. Let me know when you're ready and we'll address this biggest, biggest, biggest way. And then we'll go to how to deal with it. So the biggest way in which it shows up is in our relationships. The biggest way. The message we got as children shows up in the way we relate to others. Because actually, as a baby, your first relationship was with your parents, your mom, your dad, your mom, in fact, from her womb. Your first experience of relationships was with her. So whatever that relationship was becomes a blueprint for you of how relationships look like. Just pause there and think about, yes, think about how your childhood relationship with your parent is playing out now. It becomes the blueprint for how you think relationships are, how they look at you. And I'm going to focus mainly on, on, on moms, not that moms are big, it's just an easier one because the, a lot of us have that not all of us, but a lot of us have that, yeah, I guess, closer relationship. What I mean, closer relationship, I don't mean you liked mom more, but you know, mom is there more kind of thing. Not everyone, but just a general thinking. Think about it. How did you view your dad? How did you see your dad? What role did he play or what role did he not play? Because that could be how you start to see men in society. Whatever you were trying to get from dad that you were not getting might be what you start looking for in men. There's some people who just had a turbulent relationship with um, mom, and so they find it very difficult to have good, long-lasting relationships with other females. And then they'll tell you, I just, I just get one. I'm just a guy's guy. Well, really? Are you just a guy's guy? Or are you just a woman that didn't have a good relationship with your mom? Hmm? You know? Some people, um, I, was I was watching this documentary, and this guy was talking about the fact that um, he was very overweight as a child and his mom did everything she could to help him to, when I say help him, to try and get him to lose weight, shaming him, getting cross with him when he was eating something. She took him to nutritionist after nutritionist as a child. Or, oh my gosh, you, and she was, she, she basically was trying to get him to lose weight in all these ways that were just shaming him. Do you think that mom was not trying to help him? Of course she was trying to help him. Do you know why she was doing what she was doing? She revealed that she was doing what she was doing because she was the biggest in her childhood amongst, amongst her siblings and mom. And her mom always made her feel bad for how big she was. So she did not want the same for her son. And so she was doing all she could to make sure he didn't go through the same thing. So you understand she had good intentions, but he was receiving it as, oh my gosh, I'm being shamed for you know my weight and all of that. Guess what? The message he got was that women will not appreciate my body. Women will not appreciate me for how I look. He never felt comfortable that women will ever accept him because the woman figure, the number one woman figure did not accept his body. Do you see how these things play out? So I don't want to hear about my mom's intention because that woman's intention was not that. But the message this boy got with the way she was going about it, it's not just about the intention, how you're going about it, was that women figure will not accept how I look. How many of us were called names by parents? And so we believe that that's how the world sees us. The way in which we are related to, it shows up in how we show love to ourselves and to others. You talk about your inner critic, the biggest voice in your head. Where do you think it came from? Those words that you say to yourself, they're so negative. Who said that first? Where's the first time you heard it? All you've done is that you have made it into a huge, big human, big person of, of your own. You've given it its own life. But the initial seed of those words came from the parents and figures around us that gave that message of maybe you're not good enough. You're not as good. They, they might not have said it in those words, but you got that message that you now give it a life of its own. So because of time, I'm just going to go into how we can deal with these childhood experiences because we really want to move on and grow from it. So the first thing I would suggest is this, become aware. Become aware. Be open and stop telling yourself it didn't affect me. I turned out fine. Mm -mm -mm. 
And I'm not saying go publicly on your own. Just be aware. Look for triggers. Anything that seems like an overreaction to your present. You know when we over, maybe someone says something small and we blow up. That's a trigger. That is something to sit by yourself and think, why did I blow up? All that boy said was, um, I don't need your money. I'm going to buy, I don't need your money. Or, or the boy, or the man, all the, all the simple thing that the man said was like, oh, women shouldn't pay for this. And you blew up. Why are you blowing up? Whenever there's a trigger and you feel like you've overreacted, look in there. Because usually that will take you to where it came from. A trigger is anything you experience in the present moment that activates a feeling from the past. Make a note of this. A trigger is anything in the present moment that activates a feeling from the past. Okay, so when you erupt like that and it's come somewhere from your past, that's where to look. Look for patterns of behavior that are keeping you stuck. There'll be patterns of your behavior that are stopping you from being everything that you can be and are keeping you stuck. Look at those things. Where are those things coming from? Why? What are the things in my past that might be creating these patterns now? Again, don't live in the past. Learn from the past. Now, the next thing you want to do when you become more aware is understand the links. So you've, you've looked in your past and you've seen these links. Now, understand them. Try and make some sense of it. And the fact of the matter is it might be too difficult for you to do on your own. So this is where getting in touch with someone who understands these things, a wise friend, a professional that does it, someone like myself, Fina, or your coach, or just a, a wise friend that understands the links between you know, the childhood experiences and now. Help them to, how is this thing playing out? Please help me understand how it's playing out. And when you gain that understanding, the next thing you want to do is show empathy. Empathy. Don't go to your past. Look for the triggers. Make, understand the links so you can attack. You do that so you can show empathy. But who are we showing empathy to? Can I just hear who you think we should show empathy to? This is very important. Let me know in the chat who you're supposed to show empathy to. So when you become aware, you understand what's happening in your, part, uh, in your past and how it might be affecting your present, and you're doing all that work, it's so that you can show empathy to who? Let me know. I really want to know because that will show me how much we've understood of this process. Who are we supposed to be showing empathy to? Okay, I'll just wait and hear what people say. Okay, so I said, um, become aware. I said, become aware, look for triggers of how it might be, what might be an overreaction. Go back to the past. Look for patterns of behavior that are keeping you stuck. Don't live in the past. Learn from the past. Understand the links between your past and your present so that you can show empathy. And I'm starting to get the answers. I know there's always a delay. So you can show an, so you can show empathy to yourself. Some of us, some awful things happened. Awful. And I'm talking about abuse on different levels. And as adults, we're still blaming ourselves. Somehow you think it was your fault. If you didn't do this, if you had just, you were six, you were seven, you were a kid. I've gone through this myself where I have felt if I had just, you were a child. It wasn't your fault. You need to show empathy for yourself so that you can start to forgive yourself. A lot of us are living in shame because we are blaming ourselves for things that happened in the past. And that's why we're stuck. I'm not worthy to be with a good man. I am not worthy to get these nice things because in my past, I allowed so-and-so to happen. No, you didn't allow so-and-so to happen. You were a child. People took advantage, which is a sad truth. I don't want people, don't beat yourself up. Don't put yourself down. Show yourself empathy. There are ways to do this. And I tell you, it's easier to do it with somebody that is working with you. It's so much easier to do with someone that is able to really guide you because it's so easy to blame ourselves. 
show empathy for yourself. And the final thing about this is the final step is to connect with yourself. Spending time with yourself. I tell you the number of times we distract ourselves with Netflix or even friends or distract ourselves with all sorts of things just so we don't sit with ourselves because we don't want to hear the pain that we're going through. The number of times we do that, wow. So please, let me just encourage you all as I round this up, connecting with yourself, there's a process, there are ways to do it. I know I haven't expanded on this, but that's a whole different topic. But connecting with your authentic self, really sitting with yourself and thinking, what does Ibera like? What's important to me? What do I really value? Trying to understand those things. Who was I? No, who I am I? before all of these things what do i want what are my needs connect with your authentic self and start to move in that line and a good way of showing that you are connecting and moving in that line is that you are saying no to others and saying yes to yourself oh for some people that is so hard you are saying because a lot of us have spent our lives saying yes to others we have no understanding of our voice we don't know what our voice is this process of dealing with your childhood experiences is not about anybody else. It's about you. Don't make it about them. It's not about anybody else. It's about you. It's about saying yes to you. It's about looking at you. What do I need? It's about becoming you, returning to your authentic self. That's what dealing with your childhood experiences should look like. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. I think I've spent about 40 minutes, which is the allotted time. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> wow. Can I say the wow in the chat room? <laughs> I know you guys are all <laughs> humbled. Yeah, yeah. We said this is the Libra session. I know, 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 I know. So, yeah. Typically, when you see what we talk about, and I had to bring this home, Fina. God bless um, Ebere. God bless I'm so <laughs> in a hurry to bring up Fina. She'll be coming up shortly. We talk about personal development and financial freedom. And hearing these two women talk, I realized that there is no way you can go far in your personal development journey and financial freedom journey if you don't come into reality with yourself. So let me give you something that rings home for me. And yes, a lot of things rings home for me. And I'm being, <laughs> so yeah, this is live, but let me be a bit vulnerable here. So yeah, like you don't want to blame your parents. It's amazing. I don't know how we get that thing from as a child. I have a 12 year old and there was this day I was having a conversation with her and I said, why didn't you tell me this? And she's like, mommy, I can handle it. I don't want you to feel bad. I said, like, seriously, why are you protecting me? I should be protecting you. And truly, we carry that on a lot. So I'm the first child. And I remember growing up, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate with this. I'm told that you are the first child. It is your responsibility to ensure that your younger ones turn out right. And until... I grew up, I didn't understand how much of a baggage I was carrying because I felt responsible for other people's successes, like they didn't have a life of their own. I couldn't take decisions without like, oh, so what would happen to X, Y, Z? And now me having the privilege of interacting with a lot of people, and that's why I said this is key. I see people carrying bodies and baggages of 40 year old men, 45 years, is my younger brother, like seriously, he's an adult. Can you please live your life? And that's, you know, on the responsibility side. On the flip side, I see people and I'm like, why are you not doing anything about yourself? I have an elder sister that's just a wicked person. She would not take care of me because you just believe. And all of those things, we were not born this way. These were scripts that were written into us. And guys, I think it is high time to 
rewrite the script. You can say goodbye to the past. You see why we are saying goodbye to our past. Let me share my screen and let's play a video. Then we'll take on. Yeah, I'm sure. Ebiaire is a UK qualified teacher of economics with over 17 years experience teaching in high achieving schools. Drawing on her professional experience and with two boys of her own, she has developed incredible insights into how a child's mind works. She is able to discern what's really behind your child's emotions and behavior, giving you appropriate discipline tools to correctly return your child to their authentic selves. Iberia's passion is to help parents build strong relationships with their children and repair broken connections. This could be between parent and child, adult child and parent or adult child and inner child. She uses her skills, experience and insight to help you understand how your child experiences are affecting your current behaviors, relationship and outcomes. By understanding the child that is still in you, she helps you bring clarity and breakthrough in areas that you may have felt stuck. Ebiere believes that having a sense of purpose and meaning is critical to success in life. So, she equips and empowers parents to recognize and utilize the unique strength of the child to raise them to a life of purpose. In her work with parents as a parenting coach, Ebiere uses her knowledge and experience of psychology, educational theory and practice, and neuroscience to help improve your child's behavior and your connection with them. So, if your child struggles with aggression, anxiety, or apathy, please get in touch with Ebiere as she is confident and she can help you and your child. Ebiere has a Master's in Educational Leadership and Management from University of Nottingham and a BSc in Economics and Finance from Loughborough University. Okay. Lead. So that is Ebiere. As we said, this is deliverance session. Those are uh, Andus. When we hear that term, I think I have quite a bit of Africans there. And if you are not African, I'm sure you've heard the term, what do they call it? Ancestral courses, family courses. It stops with you. It's actually just a repeated pattern. You know, I had to understand where my parents were coming from. They were coming from era of heavy black tax, where you struggle to send one child to school and the child take care of the whole community is their responsibility. They will tell you, we use community money to send you to school. So that is what they understood. And because of that, they had very poor money habits. They had, there were no boundaries. That boundary thing, we have to take boundaries. A lot of us do not have boundaries. The reason why lots of people are being abused everywhere, you take nonsense, is because you do not have boundaries. You've been taught that you don't speak to elders. So anything you perceive as an elderly figure, you just shut down. I see full grown men, I'm looking, I'm like, can't you just stand up for yourself? No, God forbid, they can't do it. They now come home and take the aggression on their children and their wives because that is where they can play macho. Now, today is not my day to talk, Please, which we are going to have questions and answers after this. As much as you can ask, try and ask questions. Now, let us, because we are doing it kind of, not backwards, but, you know, we reinvented. After I finish, oh, after Fina finish speaking, then we are going to have Fina's bio. But now, please, with plenty excitement, let us have Fina. Wow. 
Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> good, after, oh, good evening, everyone. What do I say? Ibera, you know, oh, as always, um, awesome, awesome. I mean, actually, I, I, maybe I shouldn't even, there's no need for me to say anything anymore because Ibera has just laid it all down. <laughs> We had a very go way back. Um, awesome, awesome human, human being. Thank you so much for that um, lovely, lovely um, um, conversation. I mean, I was even just having my own aha moments um, listening to you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the community. Um, thank you for this time that we have to share. I'm just going to note the time down so that I don't, um, I don't, um, over overspend my time so how is everyone doing and yes we, we've just had a I'm sure everyone is trying to still kind of take in and just absorb all the things that we have heard so far um what I'm going to speak about is how we then break those limiting beliefs um so Ibera has really really given us a lovely um foundation um, um to, to where I continue to where I continue from yeah you said you're honestly trying to absorb yeah I hear you I hear you I hear you. Okay, I'm going to share a screen. I just, I have a little presentation that I did prepare. Um, so I will do that to make sure that's the right screen. Yes, that's the right screen. Cool. Okay, so just let me know if you can see my screen. Just let me know if you can see my screen, then I'll, I'll continue from there. Give me a thumbs up or in the chat box if you can see my screen. And we're just going to dive right in because I know we're, we're conscious of time as well. So really, what are limiting beliefs? So we've, we've, talked, we've heard about childhood experience. What are these? These childhood experiences then leads us into what are actually limiting beliefs. So normally beliefs are just our assumed truths. We've learned, we've grown up with lots of beliefs about ourselves, about our, who we are as, as human beings. Um, can someone please mute themselves? Paul? Can someone I'm mute them? Okay, to I'm going to stop for a second because I don't like distractions. I need everyone to mute themselves, please. Please, admin, can we mute everyone, please? Yeah, done. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. So, really, what are our beliefs? We, well, I'm not going to go into definition of what is belief and what is not belief, but we know that these beliefs have shaped us. We've grown up with all these beliefs from what Ibera said. We've grown up with lots of conditions, a lot of things that have been told, you know, we've been, that we've heard our religion, our culture, our priorities, our environment. So all these have formed up who, what we believe or who we believe and what we actually believe about ourselves. So it's really important to know that. But what are the self-limiting ones? The self-limiting ones are those ones that actually are quite negative. And because they're so subconscious, they're, they're in our subconscious, we don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. And I'm going to share even something that I've picked up about myself more recently than even when I was in childhood. I was, I was a child. So my dad died when I was five years old. Very, very sudden death. Very sudden. Took my mom to work. Um, and then my mom was still in hospital because she was a nurse. And while she was in hospital, um, an ambulance came, you know how the ER, you know how ER comes, an ambulance comes and someone's on a stretcher and then a team runs to pick up the, you know, the patient and stuff. So my mom's team ran to pick up the patient. And who was that patient? That was my dad on a stretcher. And my dad had brought her, taken her to work that, that evening. And so the shock of it all, he died that same night, the shock of it all. My mom, we didn't talk about my dad for years. We didn't say anything about my dad. I mean, whenever as kids, whenever we saw my, whenever we heard my mom say, oh, I'm a widow, we always used to like, oh, why is she saying that? Why is she saying that? You know that it was recently as an adult that I realized that I was ashamed of my dad's death. We didn't talk about it. She was so shocked about it that we didn't talk about it for years. So I lived, a five-year-old feeder thought about her dad's death as her dad left her because no one explained to her that dying was not an intentional thing. So she grew up with a limiting belief. She just grew up with that rejection feeling like, oh, somebody's going to reject me. So I, I'm self, I'm people pleasing. 
I'm doing different things because I don't want somebody else to reject me. And this just ties in a lot with what Eberi was talking about, our childhood experiences. And that was mine for many years. I mean, I'm still now on, on, unpacking. Anytime I'm seeing any bits of um, limiting belief, I'm, I'm unpacking them because it's all related to the shame that I carried for years and the feeling of rejection. So self-limiting beliefs have massive ways of stopping us from fulfilling our potentials. Sometimes we wanna write a book and then all of a sudden we keep on procrastinating, procrastinating, procrastinating. And we just laugh and say, oh, I'm always procrastinating. Oh, I'm, it's not, don't laugh about it. It's, there's something deeper than that procrastination. Procrastination is just the behavior that is manifesting. There's already a belief. There's already a self-limiting belief. But the procrastination is just the behavior that is manifesting from that self-limiting belief. And I've got a few examples that I've shared as well on, this, on, 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 the, um, on the slides. So that self-limiting belief is what stops many of us. And the, 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 the problem or the, the sad part of it all is that we don't go back to then link it to the past because as Iberia said, we're trying to forget the past. Oh, it was all in the past, it was all in the past. You can't move forward if you don't take the lessons from the past and learn from them and correct them and repair them. We can't move forward. So even if we're just ignoring the past, that's what we're doing. We're ignoring the past, but we're actually prolonging our problems. We're prolonging the limiting beliefs. We're prolonging, we're prolonging the delays in getting to our destiny. And this is the problem. So I love it that now there's so much research, there's so much information now about what we can do and how we can connect these dots. Because without wisdom, we cannot move forward. But it's all good knowing the information, but what do we then do about it? What do we do about the information? Because we can know all this information, but if we don't do anything about them, then no change. We're going to keep on going round the same mountain over and over again. It's almost going to be the end of 2022. Can you guys believe it? What were the things that you had in January that you were saying, ah, this is my year of breakthrough. This is my year of miracles. This is the year where everything will just happen for me. And now we're slowly getting into the last, the last few weeks of, of December. What are we saying to ourselves? Did those things that we said in January, did they happen? Did we even attempt some of them? Did we even remember some of them? What happened along the line? And that is why this webinar is such, it's, it's come at such a lovely time because this is a time where we're all reflecting on how the year has been, on what it is that we need to then do going forward. It's not a time to judge ourselves. No, don't, don't condemn yourselves for things that didn't go according to how you planned. That's not what we should do because when we condemn ourselves, we're still not going to move forward. The questions we should ask now is, what are the self-limiting beliefs that has held me and has kept me stuck? That's the question you need to ask yourself so that when you sleep, when you have those quiet moments, you can hear answers. That is how I heard answers about shame and rejection. No one came and told me, oh, Fina, oh, what you're doing, oh, you're, you're, you're carrying shame or you've got self, you've got, um, uh, um, you've been carrying, you've been feeling rejected. No one told me that. I had to ask myself very deep questions to get to these answers. And it's something you do on, it's, it's a self, you've got to really have that time to self-reflect. It's gonna to be tough because you, you might hear things that you didn't even wanna hear. You will recall things that you probably did not want to recall, but those are the steps. And I think I'm even going ahead of myself now in this presentation, but you can, you can see where I'm coming from. So self-limiting beliefs, what then we do about it? These limiting beliefs, they're not facts. The only thing, I'll tell you something about these limiting beliefs. They're not facts, but because we have believed them over and over again, guess what happens? We have had evidence that they are facts. Evidence that they are facts 
are out there for us. We, sit, we think in ourselves, we're not good enough. Oh, that person, that job, when, I, then when there was a promotion, they didn't give it to me. Oh, they didn't give me that job. Well, maybe it's because I was not good enough or I'm not qualified enough. There are always situations that justifies those limiting beliefs. And that's what makes the limiting beliefs more believable. That's what makes them more believable because there's, there usually, there's usually evidence. But you and I know that they are not true. They are not facts. But these are things that we heard a lot of time. Most of the limiting beliefs were things that we heard from grow, growing up. They, they all started from growing up. I said here that limiting beliefs stems from criticisms, the past judgments, the mistakes of the past, the failures from the past. That's where most of them stem from. And most of them were developed in our formative years, as I very talked about. So because they followed us right from childhood, from childhood, they followed us and we're here today. And today, as I'm speaking, I'm speaking to us as adults who have the, who we have this baggage that carry, we came with, um, we, we carried along with us into adulthood. But I'm also speaking to us as parents who have children today. So as we work on our self-limiting beliefs, then let us also help our children so that our children don't grow up with self-limiting beliefs. Because what happens is that this becomes generational. It's a generational pattern. And so we need to break the cycle by helping ourselves and also helping our children. Very, very vital. Because if not, if we don't help ourselves, guess what? We pass it on to our children. By default, we pass it on to our children. The shoutings, those criticisms, all those things that we received when we were children, <laughs> they played a part. They all, they left us all with self-limiting beliefs. So as Avera said, there's no need to say, oh, oh, they shouted at me and I turned out fine. Are you for real? You think you really turned out fine? It's time for us to stop deceiving ourselves. It's time for us to stop deceiving ourselves. If we turned out fine, <laughs> I don't know where most of you are from, but people like we, we, Nigeria, if we turned out fine, <laughs> Nigeria shouldn't be what it is because beatings were, were given, shoutings were shouted. Oh, what did we not hear? What did we not hear growing up? Everything we heard, all those criticisms, all of those things we heard, they left a self limiting belief in all of us. The more we deny it, the, the more we prolong self-limiting beliefs, the more power we give self-limiting beliefs. So when I say this, I want us to also tap into what are we doing with our children right now? Those shoutings, remember those shoutings, they laid self-limiting beliefs. If we're shouting today at our children, the same thing we're doing to our children. And you and I know, me and Iberia, we're not saying any of this out of a judgmental point of view. It's all, we're, this is, we're free. This is, we're, it's very, very non-judgmental. But we've got to lay the truth as the truth stands so that we can be the ones to break the cycle. I work with a lot of young people and the things I hear, sometimes I have to hold my tears I've got, I really literally have to hold my tears back up because of the things I hear that their parents said to them. And my heart breaks because they tell me what their parents have said and then they tell me what they believe about themselves. And it's, it's there, it's so evident. The self-limiting beliefs. I'm not good enough. I never get things right because these are the things that they have heard from their parents and their caregivers. Oh, should we talk about conflicts between our parents as well and conflicts? When we were young, parents arguing, uncles and aunties arguing, fighting, all those things put something in, our, in us. It affected all of us in one way or the other. And sometimes parents say, oh, but we, we, we try and make sure we don't do it in front of the children. Your children are hearing. They can hear through. <laughs> oh, God. They can hear 
through the walls, they know. They can see the tension. They know when both of you are not talking, they know. And they are caught in the middle, not because you have made them caught in the middle, but because they are part of both of you, they feel torn. My dad is angry with my mom. My mom is angry with my dad. Remember, mom and dad are part of our children. They have half your blood and half, 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 half the dad's blood. So they're caught in between whether we want it, whether we like it or not. And when we have these conflicts, it's about who is right, who is wrong, who is right, who is wrong, whereas your children are torn. Oh, should I go talk to dad? But mom may be upset if I talk to dad. Should I go talk to mom? But dad may be upset. So in childhood, we, there are a lot of um, coping mechanisms that we came up with. We came up with lots of coping mechanisms to deal with these trauma that, was, was, that we saw and we experienced. And some of those coping mechanisms was to act tough, to act strong as if nothing happened. I remember in high school, I, I went to boarding school in Nigeria. I remember then when the teachers would flog and would flog us, you know. And then of course, you know, students, we all want to act tough. Ah, I did nothing happen. Ah, I just put my hand like that, it just flogged. I just did my hand like that, it just, so we act as if it was no big deal. Oh, come on. Did we enjoy it? We didn't enjoy it. So every flog that we did, that was a flog of not loved. That was a flog of unseen. That was a flog. We used to tell, we used to call seniors back then wicked and all that with all the things that they did for us, to us. It affected us. So we just coped with it. Like we acted tough. Ah, it's no big deal. Oh, I can kneel down from now till when. It's no big deal. I remember some punishments that we had back then. They would make us kneel down and walk. Oh, oh. <laughs> so that's why now, if you ask me about punishment, ah, you're, you've got me on a different level. Because many of us as parents, we think that punishment is the way to change our children's character. Punishment doesn't work. Punishment just makes them comply with you. But they're only going to comply with you for a short while. They will grow up and they will remember you. They'll remember what you did. And this generation today is totally, they're totally different from us. <laughs> you know how we are saying, oh, we don't want to say because we don't want to um, affect, we don't want to hurt our parents. We don't want to. This generation is not about that. This generation, they're going to tell you because this generation is brought up. We, 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 this generation is about, there's a lot of focus on their emotions. So things that hurt them, they will tell you one way or the other. If they don't tell you verbally, they're going to tell you through their behavior. they will tell you through their behavior. And we're seeing, oh, oh, we're seeing so much of it. We're seeing so much of it. Go talk about behaviors, talk about mental health issues. We're seeing all of it manifest itself. So we've got a duty, all of us here on this platform, we've got a duty to break this cycle. And it starts with us. It starts with us. Is it poverty as well during childhood? Oh God. Oh, that's another, that's another big one. That's another big one. I, I'll tell you something about myself as well. So when we were growing up, of course, my mom bringing up four girls all by herself in Nigeria. And um, we used to do a lot of managing. Oh, we manage this, we manage that. Oh, just manage this, just manage that. And I used to brag about how I'm so good with managing. Oh, yeah, I can manage this, I can manage that. But do you know what? You know that is a self-limiting belief. Because the more you can manage, then you're not really going to be seeking for much more because you're okay and you settle with what you have. So I had to start reprogramming my mind about managing. No, I'm, I'm not good in managing. <laughs> I'm more abundant. Let's, so I can see the opportunities out there. There's nothing, there's nothing bragging about managing. When we brag about the way we can manage things, then we're, we're keeping ourselves in a box. We're blind to the opportunities to, to even grow and to be abundant because we what we have now we can manage. Okay, you, you, you get paid every first, every first of the or every 15th of the month. You say, okay, I've got enough till the 15th. Okay, oh, I'm good. Okay, then 15th comes. Okay, I've got enough till the next 15th. The limiting belief right there. 
a limiting belief right there. So poverty in childhood as well is, is a part of, part, of, part of the reasons. Silent treatment, I think I talked about it. Emotional negligence. Oh. And when Ibera gave an example about a child, a child crying, and then you go to the child or you don't go to the child. You know, there was, um, I was watching a video some, some weeks ago, and apparently there were psychologists back then in the 50s, 1950s and 40s, who said that when your child is crying, leave your child to cry. So a lot of parents in those days grew up with, oh, this child is just wanting to be spoiled, or this child, um, it just wants too much, just ignore him, let him cry. After crying, he will sleep. It was psychologists people that said that thing back then. When I watched this video, I was like, oh my God, you could see some parents in the audience of that video crying. But those psychologists were wrong. Because we've got to attend to our children. Because if we, if we let that child keep on crying, the child will think I'm not needed, I'm not seen, I'm not loved. And these um, um, limiting beliefs, they start from as early as when children can't even speak. Preverbal. When they are at preverbal stages, they start to feel unwanted because they cried for a while and they were ignored. And then parents are like, oh, yeah, I had to show, I have to, yeah, I have to, I have to, I have to toughen, I have to toughen them. You're toughening them? You're not toughening them. You're increasing their limiting beliefs because that emotional neglect is part of it. You talk about friendship issues with young people, teenagers, they go through a lot of friendship issues they go through, being bullied, rejection, relationship issues, all these things, they build up. They, they are the things that are, are foundational to a lot of the self-limiting beliefs that we all have and our children as well all have. Our, our parents' words became our inner voices. I very mentioned, uh, mentioned that as well. Things like, what is wrong with you? I, I tell parents, in today's world, don't ask your children, your child, what is wrong with them because nothing is wrong with them. Ask your child what they did. Talk about the behavior, talk about the action. Don't start saying what is wrong with them because nothing is wrong with them. Because a child, what a child interprets those words to be that something must be wrong with me. So they go to school, they don't understand maths or they don't understand English, they don't understand the subject. In their minds, they conclude something must be wrong with me. And when you, they have that mindset of something must be wrong with me, then guess what? They don't, they, they, they don't push themselves forward or they don't push themselves um, to go and find out more how they can solve that problem. Their problem solving skills just stay stagnant because they believe in their heart that there's something wrong. Is something wrong with you? Are you stupid? You stupid boy, you stupid girl. Or do they have two heads when you when you start to compare? And we all laugh about it. Oh, <laughs> our parents, yeah. Then if you if we have eighty, our parents will will will, will um, abuse us and tell us that what happened to the remaining twenty? Uh, what other uh, those things are not right because they formed a limiting belief in our minds. Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you read like your sister? Get out of my sight, shut up, get out of my sight. All those things makes, made us feel smaller than we were. And the smaller we felt about ourselves, the further away we were from our authentic selves. It's like what a bear talked about. Words, their words, our parents, our teachers, the, our older, either siblings or cousins, all those people that were in our lives as we were growing up their words became our inner voices. The same way our own words are becoming our own children's inner voices. And as I said, the, our limiting beliefs manifest in our behavior. So I know I did a lot of people pleasing when I, was, when I was young, when I was a teenager, I did a lot of people pleasing because I didn't want another hit of rejection. The rejection that I had with my dad dying was too painful for me. I did not want that repeated. So why people pleased. And it came from that, my thought of, I, am, I was rejected. So see some examples here. Who will say, I'm, I'm powerless. And if you're thinking, if your self-limiting belief is, I am powerless, then guess what you'll be doing? You won't be standing up for yourself in places. 
you will shrink. You will be the one in the background. If your limiting belief is, I'm, I'm not what being listened to because I was in my, when I was growing up, I was always told, shut up. You don't mean anything. Who are you? You're the last born. Don't, don't, who are you to speak here? You're a child. Who are you to speak? Your self-limiting belief is saying, I'm not worth being listened to. And because your self-limiting belief is saying, I'm not worth listen, being listened to, guess what's happening? You're not speaking up. People can do things. You don't speak up. Your boundaries, as we talked about earlier, your boundaries, you're not, you're not, you're not speaking up because in your, in your mind, in your subconscious mind, you've grown up with thinking, I'm not being, I'm not worth being listened to. Another example is everything I do has to be perfect. If you were, if you were brought up with those things where you were, if you made mistakes in your home, oh, the trouble that you were going to enter, you didn't, you didn't even know where it was going to come from. So in your, your limiting belief now is that everything's got to be perfect. Now, because everything has got to be perfect, guess the behavior that manifests. You become risk adverse. You don't want to take risks. You don't want to take risks. You're writing a book. You've been writing this book for 40 years. That book has still not been, has still not been published because you're scared. Will I make a mistake? If I make a mistake, oh, what would that? Ha? You keep going on and on. Procrastination as well. Another self-limiting belief, I'm worthless. If people really, if you really got those, you know what I mean, if you really got those insults or abuse, you know, abuse on different levels growing up, your self-limiting belief is thinking I am worthless. You start to act def defensively. Anybody says something, you're very quick to, to act. You're very quick to react. You're just, you always being defensive. That's the behavior that manifests out of that limiting belief. I can't handle conflicts. If you, if you, you, if you had these um, things growing up or in school and stuff where people fought you and you couldn't, you, you couldn't fight back or you kept quiet or just different things, or even your parents were kept on you know, being in conflict, you grow up and the behavior is that you keep on giving into, giving into others because you just don't want to handle the conflict. And, and that's my, my other one there. I'm good at managing things. I used to brag, oh yeah, I'm, I'm good with managing. Oh yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll always be good. You become resistant to pursue wealth. You don't even realize it. <laughs> you don't realize it. Somebody calls you for something, you delay in replying the person. You just self-sabotage and you wonder why. Think through what is the self-limiting belief You've got to ask yourself these questions. Now, how can we get rid of these self-limiting beliefs? How, what, how can we do it? And I've got a few things here. Identifying that self-limiting belief first is number one. But you've got to take a moment. You've got to ask yourself some questions. So I don't know what self-limiting beliefs are playing in your, in, your, in your life. I don't know what behaviors are manifesting that are showing that are signs of some limiting beliefs. I don't know. So what I encourage everyone to do is ask yourself questions, deep questions. I do it through my, through my prayers. I ask myself, what am I doing, Lord? What am I doing that is stopping me? Because these limiting beliefs, they don't just, they're not just there in your face, like, oh yeah, this is my limiting belief. This is my, they're not there. <laughs> You've got to go in, inside to find them out. They're very comfortable where they are because remember, They've lived with you for so long. So we've got to identify them first. I, I had to ask myself these critical questions. And then I was getting, oh my God. Yeah, that's how I always talk about managing. Or guess, I don't know, my limiting beliefs before. I used to say, oh, I'm not a salesperson. I don't really sell. Yeah, well, then, especially then because I was, when I was in my career as a chartered accountant, I used to say, oh, it's business people that sell. You know, we, we are career people. We don't sell. Oh, when I then became a business person, that, that, that word, <laughs> it affected me because I was so fearful to sell. Like, how can I tell somebody that this costs $20? How can I say this? Oh my, you, the fear. But it was because of those things that I believed about myself. So you have to identify your limiting beliefs. Then challenge it. Where did it come from? I challenged mine. 
it came from, I knew, I knew where the, the, the managing thing came from. I knew where the rejection thing came from. I said, no, as an adult, I now know that my dad did not die purposely. Death happened. Unfortunately, no one explained it to me. But guess what? Now, because I'm a mom, I always explain things to my children more than normal because I wasn't explained stuff to. And I even spoke to my mom about it, but not speaking to my mom about it in a condescending way. I just said, mom, this is one of the things that I picked up as I was growing up, that this was because if you had told me that de this is dead, people, you know, I wouldn't have, that would have not happened. But mom, I understood your own situation because you were shocked. Someone took you to work and the person, by the time you, you, you were still at work, the person came to the hospital and the person died. So I could understand your point of view, but I shared it with her. And I, I see myself as a parent now, I explain things more and more to my children because I don't want them to have that gap where they would then make assumptions like how I made assumptions. I'm not saying I'm going to be able to, to catch everything with them, but the ones that I'm aware of, I'm definitely very intentional to, to share with them. So challenge those self-limiting beliefs that you catch. Don't be ashamed of those limiting beliefs that you catch. Challenge them. Where did they come from? And now as your adult self who is grown and more intelligent than you were when you were a kid, you can challenge it. Say, no, that's not my, that's not my story going forward. I'm here to break that cycle. Recognize the potentially damaging consequences that could happen. If I continued to talk about, to, to dwell in the fact that I'm being rejected, if I continued to deal with that, I would not have the flourishing friendships that I have because I will keep thinking that they're going to reject me. So I would avoid friendships. So you have to recognize the, the damaging consequences of the limiting beliefs that you've recognized. If I continued with the limiting belief that I am an expert in managing, I can manage, I can manage, then I'm going to lose sight of many financial opportunities in front of me. So recognize them. And then once you've done these three things, create a new belief. But one of my daily affirmations is I am accepted. I make sure I say that every day. It's part of my list of affirmations. I am accepted. I am a worthy child of God. It's part of my, my affirmations stuck, on, stuck in my bathroom. Create a new belief. Remember, it took you years. That self-limiting belief has lived with you for years. You're going to now need to create a new belief. And it's not about saying it once a day, not once and once a week. <laughs> you need your mind to know that you're a different human being. You need your mind to know that you're not settling for those self-limiting beliefs anymore. So you've got to repeat it to yourself over and over and over again. Okay, very important. And as, as I shared these, what's my last bit here? What's, what's the last one? Sorry, I can't see this. Oh, I need to go back. Hold on one second, because I've got this over here. What did I have here at the end? And then put it into practice. Yeah, put it into practice. Put it into practice, saying it over and over and over again. Okay? All right, cool, cool, cool. Okay, let me, let me go forward. I, I think I'm still good for time. Let's go forward. Okay, so this is an action plan. I just, I just put this together. And I said, okay, think about your self-limiting beliefs. What are they? I've just got a few examples here. I'm not good enough. Reframe it. I'm good enough. I don't have resources. I have lots of, I have resources in abundance. I'm not as good as others. I am good enough. I'm, a, I'm afraid of failure. Failures are just part of life. I am not afraid of it. I am courageous. I am not a morning person. That's another thing that some people say, oh, I'm not a morning person. That's just a self-limiting belief. And who told you you're not a morning person? Or you just grown up thinking you're not a morning person. Reframe it. Because sometimes in the mornings, you can get to do lots of things. Don't tell you, don't, don't, don't put yourself in a box. I'm not a salesperson. That, that used to be mine. <laughs> or I don't have the talents. Or I'm not someone that follows through. You've got to reframe it. If you don't reframe it, you are going to be going round the same mountain over and over again and not getting to where you are destined to get. So that's an important, important part that I thought to, to share. And then with parents, now that you've overcome your own self-limiting beliefs, please, one of the ways 
to get your children, one of the ways to get your children to be confident in themselves, one of the ways to get your children to know who they are, to be their authentic, authentic selves, as Ibera told us, is to please listen to them. Listening is really, really key. We didn't have a lot of listening models to us and, and in our generation. And I, I know I'm speaking generally, but that's, that's been the story of many of us. You, you can come to your parents and say, oh, stop disturbing me. Can't you see I'm doing this? Who are you? you know, remember, we weren't very listened to. And so we got on. We, got just, we just got on with life. And what happens is that we are then repeating the same things to our children. Can't you see I'm on the phone? Can't you see the... Uh, uh, Listening to them is the key to helping them, helping them to live with more positive emotions, more positive beliefs. If you have smaller children, get down to the same level with them as you speak to them. Smile, use affirming words when you speak to your children. Build them up when they're talking to you. Oh, wow. Oh, really? Wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. Oh, I love what you're saying. I can't wait to hear more. Let your children, so that they speak up. When you listen to them, your children are able to speak up. When they're talking to you, get into the conversation. They need you. They need you to hear them. Because when, they, when we don't listen to them, what happens is we open the doors for the world to speak to them. I'm going to repeat that again. When we don't work on listening to our children, we open the doors for the world to speak to them. And now our children don't have to step out of the house for the world to speak to them. All they need to do is go on their phone, go on their laptop, go, on, go, go in school. The world will speak to them. So we need to catch them and listen to them so that they can hear us. A lot of parents have wasted a lot of their valuable influence because they have not learned to listen. Our words have power. And as we said, words of our parents became our inner voices. Our own words become our children's inner voices. And I'm just, I have a few examples here that I thought I'd share with you. Things, instead of saying, you're a naughty boy or child, if, the, if the, maybe the child beats, you know, beats the brother or something, just tell him, biting your brother was a naughty thing to do. What would kind Josh do better? Again, you're affirming him that he's kind. You're not saying that he's naughty. Yes, what he did was naughty. But what would a kind Josh, what would a kind Bola, what would a kind Andre do next? Instead of saying, you made me angry, please don't make me angry. You're always making me angry. No, admit, I felt angry when you scratched your sister's face. I felt angry when you, you didn't do this. I would like you to show your sister that you love her. I would love you to, to do the things that I asked you to do. The words, our words, is what helps form our children's beliefs. Instead of saying, don't leave that door open, don't leave that door open. Let's, let's keep the, let's just say, let's keep the door open, please. So that it's not about the don'ts, the fear. All these things just make them very like, oh, I shouldn't do, oh, I shouldn't do this. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Speak to them in ways that they can, they can see that they are loved and they are accepted. Instead of shouting, don't leave your shoes in the corridor. Don't do this. Don't tell them what, what to do. Put your shoes in the box. And the more we speak to them in these affirming ways, the more our children are able to, to develop their self um, they, they're resilient. They're able to develop the way that they speak to themselves. And it reduces the amount of self-limiting beliefs. Instead of saying things like, oh, you're just speaking rubbish. You're not making sense. I had a hard time understanding what you said. Please try again and listen. So just... I. I can, I, there's so many examples that we can give, but you know what I'm talking about. You know what happens when, before you know it, you're already shouting in your house. It's coming from what we saw growing up. And so we need to be the ones to break this cycle. 
we've got to break it. Don't come. Let's not be, we've been here now for nearly two hours. Let's not come on this um, webinar, hear all the things that we've heard, and then go back to same old, same old. What a waste of two hours that will be. Breaking self-limiting beliefs is a process. You've got to give yourself lots of grace and patience because these are things that you carried all through childhood. They're not going to go immediately today. They're not going to go immediately in one week. You've got to give yourself time and stay accountable as well to someone for the changes you're putting into place. I'm sure you've got people that you can talk to, mentors, you know, good friends. Stay accountable because you want to make sure that when it's time to sell, that you are selling. That was me. I want to make sure I'm keeping myself accountable. I have this stuff coming up. I need to sell these things. So I have someone or people that are going to ask me, did you share that? Did you share that? Because I need to keep myself accountable. Because if not, I can default back to, what will people say? What will people say? Lord, I've repeated stay accountable to, uh, twice. <laughs> so it was a mistake, but it, it just means us to, to re-emphasize it. <laughs> stay accountable. Self-limiting beliefs. We've heard a lot about it. I'm sure this is not our first time. But let today be the first time that we really, really commit to doing something about it. Let today be the first time that we say enough is really enough. I have some affirmations just as I finish, which we, we can share. I am better than my limiting beliefs. I am a positive person. I am above my limiting beliefs. I forgive myself for my past thoughts. I forgive myself for the opportunities that I miss. I forgive my inner child. I am a better person now. I'm free to live. I am free to live my authentic self. Oh. Wow. Can I see the reactions in the chat room? Wow. <laughs> wow 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 okay yeah well woo. Mm. I, i'm i'm trying to get myself together should i play the profile should i talk and one limiting belief that came to my mind while you were speaking fina is and i'm sure everybody on this call you know we laugh about those things that's mm. the funny thing yeah and it's tragic Mm -hmm. is village people. How many people are on that seat of village people? Exactly. And we don't understand how much it is affecting us. Because growing up, we grew up in a culture where we were not held accountable. Yeah. Somebody must be responsible for what is happening to you. There must shall be an explanation. Shani, permit me, I'm a Yoruba woman. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... If you came up from a polygamous home, it's the other woman. Mm -hmm. She's the reason why you did not. It must be something else. It's something yeah. external to us. When you go to school and you don't have good grades, the teacher did not like me. So mm. There must just be a problem. And we grow up with that kind of mindset. So when you come into the workplace, for instance, and things are not going well, we are not able to take constructive criticism yes. because we believe that people do not want us to grow. That's it. And we, we just believe, and it's sad because yeah. what we believe is what we attract. Yes. So because we believe that the world is conspiring against us, the world starts conspiring against us because what Evidence. you believe yep. is what you are getting. Yes. Another limiting belief I see a lot personally from where I sit and mm -hmm. I see that I have a lot of guys here and I hope you guys are smiling behind your computer is that men don't cry. And mm -hmm. I said, who told you the bullshit? Mm -hmm. Forgive my French. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian by affiliation. And I, when I read Bible, Jesus cried. 
Exactly. They say Jesus wept. In fact, he wept two times. He was what documenting. But yet, you're a macho African man. Please, nobody should see your emotions. Even your wife, you can't be vulnerable. And people are dying early, and we are wondering why men are dying. Because they can't be vulnerable. They can't come and speak about what is bothering them. I, mm. I was reading, permit me to quote my book. I know this is an open, but this is a book that shaped my life. And they were talking about Jonathan and David, that they wept until there was no strength in them. These mm. are warriors. Yeah. So how did we get to a stage as a people that we believe that it is weakness for a man to express? It makes you inhuman. You're a human being. It's okay to cry. It's okay to show emotions. Mm -hmm. And I equally see lots of relationships. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is just amazing. Yes, we are talking about money. People cannot speak with their spouse, their wives, because they believe that a woman should not know about my money. Mm -hmm. It does not matter how intelligent she is. It does not matter what she can bring to the table. But it is a sign of weakness for me as a man to start discussing about financial matters yeah. with women. Yeah. Like seriously, yeah. somebody like Hansen Gozi, see where she is. Imagine if you sit there with it and say, no, she's just a woman. Exactly. You know, she, women are just made for the kitchen. And that's like, please, all this yesterday, all of us together, all mm -hmm. of us, you know, as she was talking, I was writing things down because there are more things we need to say goodbye to. Yes. You are not who you think you are. Mm. Permit me to say that. Hi, Kemi. Good to see you. Welcome. You are not who you think you are. You are who you've been told you are exactly. over time. And repetition brings conviction. Yep. So when you hear things like, and th this particular one, I, I struggled with it. I got my deliverance. Like, what are you saying? Who will possibly listen to you? Like, <laughs> I think I was sharing with my younger sister one time that the first time I spoke and people were like, wow, that was amazing. I had to look. <laughs> it can't be me because <laughs> growing up, <laughs> you kept hearing, who would? Mm -hmm. Who would? So in your mind, it's like, yes, I can do other things, but it can't be speaking. And that thing you said about um, taking 40 years to write a book now, some of us, we can understand. See, you are not poor. It's just your mind. Mm -hmm. Because the book That's that right. will bring you billions, yes. you refuse to write it. Yes. How would you make money? Exactly. exactly. You have to be able to jump up. And that's why I said, you know, this is really for all of us. I can go on and on yes. because personally, this is just amazing for me. We're about to open up to Q&A. I'll play your profile and we'll open up to Q&A. But permit me to share this. I have um, some of my siblings online. It's crazy, <laughs> but I have to share this. The child's mind is crazy. Like the way a child's mind thinks yes. is very funny. And that's probably why I could connect with you the first time I heard you speak. When you were sharing about how you lost your dad and you locked up. So I was a bit older when I lost my dad. I was about 16. Mm -hmm. But somehow I just felt like I must have done something wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's father is alive. Why should it be my own that would die? Mm -hmm. And when I now went to school and they asked, where is your father? Ah, no, my father did not die. It's bad people that their father dies. <laughs> my own father is alive. It's just that he's somewhere where you cannot see. So I fabricated a story for my reality. Fast forward maybe like some 20 years later, because as you said, we don't talk about these things. African mm. home, you know, every yeah. real pie, we, we laugh about it. We make jokes about it. Everybody's fine. And I was speaking with my younger sister and, you know, we had matured enough to speak a bit about some things. Yes. And I was telling her that, ah, this was what I used to say in the university. She was like, eh, auntie, we thought you were the strong one. So you two made up stories. I said, wow, you two made you up stories. So you realize you that. This is this is just crazy. Yes. I was speaking with a guy that he was he was a bit matured when his dad died too. And it was like for years. He, 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 it's crazy mm. <laughs> that for years, the day before his father died, that, those were the days of Nepa, no, not Nepa, Nitel lines when they used to do those <laughs> black cables mm. and all of that. So the day before. You know, teenage truancy now is yes. somehow figured out how to tap somebody's line and make yes. calls. Yes. 
So he tapped the line, he made the call. The following day, they came to tell him his dad had died. His mind told him he was what he did for years. So there are some of us that carry this crazy guilt trip. Crazy. You, you got to just say goodbye, let's go, and welcome to your new you. Let me play Pina's profile. Finn and Chichi is a passionate parenting consultant and coach. She has worked with parents and teens for over 10 years, helping parents with how to understand, communicate, connect, and raise the next responsible leaders of tomorrow. Her organization, Parenting Teen Solutions Limited, is dedicated to educating, empowering, encouraging, and equipping parents with the right tools to help themselves and their teens as they navigate through the changes and challenges of the adolescent journey. It is a mission to help, support, disrupt wrong parenting habits or norms and transform the lives of families through wholesome, compassion-led thinking. Our parenting experience and work has given our opportunities to speak on global platforms, local UK authorities, schools and churches both in the UK and around the world. She is the host of the Parenting Teen Solution podcast, listed as the 11th in the top 61 podcast list for parenting teens. She is an Amazon best-selling author, an international speaker and a mother of two young adults and two teenagers. Ladies and gentlemen, on this prestigious platform, let us make welcome our speakers and moderator on today's webinar. Whoa, amazing. So that is Pina. So Q and A. I'm sure I'm sure it's been amazing. I'm sure it's been amazing. I'm sure it's been amazing. So can we have a question? She can raise your hand. Sorry, I had to step in. Bumi's network was acting up, so I stepped in. Questions, 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 questions. And feedback for me is in the chat room. Nathan, I can see your hand up. Let's have you. I know this is quite emotional and all of that, but you don't get these ladies every day. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's, it's really emotional. Okay, so sorry. What I'm going to do right now, 